I'm actually very, very excited uh, to be here with you today. Uh, thank you to uh, the Eco Districts team uh, for inviting, inviting me here. Uh, there are some incredible individuals and, and organizations that are doing work uh, across cities, um, across the United States. And you know, we talk a lot about two different types of return. We talk about, all right, what's the social return? How do we measure that? What do we look at? And we talk about the financial return. Is there a financial return? And I, and I argue that there's a specific type of return that we're not talking about, uh, and that's the return of trust. So my name is Rohit Malhotra. I run an organization called the Center for Civic Innovation, and we are in the uh, trust building business. Uh, we operate as a honest broker between government agencies uh, and communities to try to build trust uh, because we believe that a city's social and economic strength depends on that. So I had two heroes in my life growing up. They were characters in every single one of my dad's stories. And if you have immigrant parents, you know that immigrant dads only have two stories that they tell over and over and over again. The two characters were Jimmy Carter and my grandfather. Because of the fascinating details of these individuals' lives, I found a love for government and community. And today, as these things feel like opposites, I want to talk about a way to bring them back together. Because we all know how necessary that is in a time like right now. My my father found inspiration in the story of Jimmy Carter, a man who left the Navy to be a peanut farmer in Georgia because his family farm was in trouble. Carter fought to keep his farm, and against all odds, he made it happen. Everyone told him he was crazy, but he did it. My dad moved to the United States from a small village in India in the late 1970s, and President Carter was his first role model in this new country that he called home. The first time my mother was ever on an airplane was a one-way ticket from New Delhi, India to Chicago, Illinois. And she was there to go meet her knight in shining armor. She was married to this guy who uh, lived in America. And I always laughingly said she met my dad. He had a small studio apartment uh, in the south side of Chicago where he had two roommates, uh, loneliness and a cockroach. And my mom got there and she was like, this is gonna be interesting. Uh, my dad said, I'm gonna be a lawyer. That's what I'm going to do. So he would go and take these classes, go back and forth uh, to a small community college and said, I'm going I'm to be a lawyer for my family. And one day while he was walking to class, my dad was jumped on the street. He was dragged across the street back to where he lived, tied to a chair and beaten unconscious. And that's how my mom found him within the first month of their marriage. And so when I was born, they said, we got to get out of here. We gotta, we gotta go back to India. We gotta raise our, our kid in India. Uh, so we moved to India right after I was born and my parents were like, "Never mind, we're going back to the United States. But they said, this time, this time's gonna be different. This time is gonna be different unlike any other. So my dad took a, a suitcase. He went to every little market across India. He threw a bunch of little trinkets and, and whatnot inside of a, uh, a suitcase. And then we got on a flight and, and went to upstate New York where my dad saved enough money to do his first trade show. Our whole life savings was inside of the suitcase. And I remember that day, my dad went to go, uh, he, went, he went to go to this trade show. My mom and I are pacing back and forth. Dad's gonna come home soon. Dad's gonna come home soon. Dad's gonna be home soon. And dad comes back and he has that same suitcase in his hand. We said, damn it this time was supposed to be different. This time it was supposed to work. My dad then took that suitcase, he opened it right in front of my mother and there was nothing inside. There are a few moments in your life that you remember for the rest of your life. The first time you see your parents cry is one of those moments. I watch my parents hug each other and say, everything's gonna be all right. We're gonna make it. Everything's gonna be okay. My dad is an entrepreneur. He wouldn't call himself that. To this day, he won't call himself that. But my dad is an entrepreneur. Just like his newfound idol, Jimmy Carter, an honest entrepreneur. And 
both, uh, I, I was convinced that my dad really liked Jimmy Carter uh, because they both had accents that no one could really understand. Uh, but instead, it was because both of them found entrepreneurship as this deep-rooted feeling of breaking out of something that they're facing in their lives. The best entrepreneurs come from that particular circumstance. As I mentioned, my other hero is my grandfather. My dad grew up in this small village in, in Punjab, and every, every night, my grandfather would go across the village from small house to small house to small house and ask if people had eaten that night. And if there was a house that said, yes, they had eaten and they had leftovers, he would pick those up, and he would go take them to the houses that didn't have it. And sometimes that house that, didn't, <laughs> that the food was taken from was his own. And this sense of community, this sense and belief that people are so much more uh, than they're just individual selves, this is something that was instilled in me from a very young age. I was told communities stick together to thrive, even or especially if they're poor. So I grew up with this love, a love for government and a love for community. And my dad used to say, if Jimmy Carter and my grandfather ever met each other one day, they would be the best of friends. But in a time like now, the mere idea of a government official and a community activist being in the same room with one another sounds preposterous. The two things I grew up loving are at odds with one another. Government has stopped listening to the people it serves, and we the people have stopped engaging with and trusting our government. It's in moments like right now, on the heels of an election that we feel it the most. It's when people who are vying for a leadership position pick and choose the audiences that they want to talk about and to based upon a strategy or based upon emotion. It's where passions and frustrations of people are bucketed into specific issue areas and debate topics where you got to be on one side or you're on the other. In moments like today, when government leaders are asking and fighting to earn people's trust, they often list the things that they've done to make things right. In Flint, Michigan, government officials from across agencies brought together local community members together to say that the water pipes, which funneled through two filters, zip code and privilege, that those water pipes had been fixed. That community, like dozens of others across the United States, asked the most important question back to those government officials. They said, how can I possibly drink this water again? How could I ever trust you again? Across the country, according to a study by Pew, less than 20% of people trust their government today. That's a historic low. So what happened? I argue that now, during a national election, is the perfect time to have this conversation. But when this will really matter is when the elections are over, when the balloons have dropped along with the microphones, when the crowds have scattered and our TVs changed from present day rallies to past episodes of the West Wing. Will we keep the conversation going? Because that is where we have a real opportunity to build trust again, outside of elections, because that's where movements are built. And we build it from people to people because that's how movements are built. And we must start with empathy. And that only comes with us seeing each other more. Government agencies, we cannot only see you at the inconveniently placed 3 p.m. town hall or the next ribbon cutting. We gotta see you at the barbecue. We gotta see you at the next school board meeting. We need to see you when the cameras are off. People find it very hard to trust government because we're the center of your world during elections, but then you cheat on us with Becky with the Fortune 500 company. I know the cultured ones in the room now, that's good. <laughs> Queen Bay would be very disappointed right now. A disproportionate amount of time diverts to fundraising instead of actually continuing to spend time in the communities that government agencies aim to serve. Larry Summers, a, a presidential advisor and economist, wrote a piece on government trust that references Mayor Menino of Boston. He said, I was struck by his attention to the little things. 
While we waited at a playground, he would check for fences in the hole, or, or for fences that had holes. Or when we visited a school, he would note the missing tiles. At the time, it seemed odd and micromanaging. And the conclusion that Summers comes to is that faith in government's ability to do big things depends on its success in executing routine responsibilities. Now, while this is true, that people want an effective government that doesn't necessarily waste money, I argue that's not why people loved Menino. They loved that he was at the playground in the first place, that he noticed the holes in the fence, that he saw the missing tiles. It made him human. His perspective on governance started with empathy, and he lived it every single day in his work. People in communities are not perfect, and neither are government leaders. But I argue that we are not looking for perfection, especially right now. What we want is authenticity. This past decade has equipped us with more data produced in a minute of time than we have had over lifetimes. That information is important and is meant to show government how to engage with people, but doesn't give them a pass to not do it at all. Data and technology is never going to be a replacement for human interaction because people are not data points. They are individuals wrapped up in journeys with experiences and cultures. And the misuse of data and the decrease in face-to-face -face interaction has led to historic shifts from a worldwide recession to Brexit to a housing crisis that destroyed morale. Governments must connect back with people on the ground. I learned that through a number of moments in my life that not people, not governments can just go into a community before they've even talked to them and tell them what their solution should be. This is true across communities and identities. If government passes legislation that impacts housing, it must do so with the understanding and experience of the pain that each and every person, including many of my friends and family, face when they pack up boxes because they just lost their home. People fell out of love with institutions, including government, and it shows. The United States has a 72-year low on voter turnout. There's this overwhelming overwhelming sense of loss and bitterness. And in elections across the 22 largest metro cities, voter turnout ranged from 7% and could not even cross 50%. An official in Philadelphia is remembered for saying, we should pop champagne if we cross 25%. That official was not named Drake. All right, this crowd doesn't listen to hip hop. It's fine, I got it. All right, it's cool. Denver doesn't have a hip hop artist that's put out a major out. Maybe Macklemore is from Denver, I don't know. All right. Look, y'all, we got to vote. We got to vote. We can't just show up during presidential elections. We have to share our voices in mayoral races, in state races, for our sheriffs, our judges, our district attorneys. The last mayoral race in Atlanta, and I'm about to put my own city on blast, was decided by 714 votes. That is smaller than most Indian weddings. Too many people have fought for this right to vote. And it's our responsibility to exercise that power. Voting matters, but we gotta know the roles that government actually plays. We can't just say, thanks Obama, when stuff doesn't go right. We gotta know who our elected decision makers are, not just the institutions they represent. The people are the decision makers, and that's who we build trust with. Granted, it's not easy to know every single person that holds public office. There are almost 90,000 government agencies in the United States. Federal government, state government, county government, you name it. That's not even including neighborhood councils. But when we learn about new elected positions and those who serve our streets and our cities, we got to go and tell it to 10 other people. It could be an awkward dinner fact. If you're an artist, go paint it on government property. That's one way to get them to show up. <laughs> this work is a two-way street. Government does not have to and, do and should not bear this burden alone. People want to be involved in building a solution. This is best explained through my dating life. So I, when, I, when I was in college, I used to take girls to this one noodle shop. It was delicious. But I took them there for one reason, because this noodle shop was a make your own stir fry. And you would make your own, you know, it would be great. 
The reason I took him there was not because it was the best noodle shop in town. It was because no one would ever say the food wasn't good. Uh, because they would say, I made it. Uh, and no one ever says that their food is ever bad. Oh my God, this is the best dish I've ever had. Because they made it. And this is no different than our noodles of legislation. Because when we're involved in the solution and we're engaged, even if the results are not perfect, we'll see the good in it before we see the bad. When the shooting in Ferguson happened, people in Atlanta wondered, what is the grand jury process in my own city when there's a police-involved shooting? So my organization, the Center for Civic Innovation, brought in two police officers and two attorneys to meet with protesters that were peacefully protesting right outside of our city. At first, the police officers came in on the defensive, saying, people don't understand our role. They don't understand what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, and they don't see that the majority of officers are good. And the protesters came out on the offensive. I'm ready to debate. I'm ready to go. They don't even know what's about to come to them, Re repeating disturbing statistics and stereotypes that they're facing. The conversation, though, was beautiful. The protesters talked about their fears, their feelings that their lives didn't and still don't matter. They talked about protesting not just as disruption, but as a form of healing. The police officers talked about their own fears. They went into uncut scenes that don't make it to television. Police officers dropping to their knees, sobbing after they see acts of violence, terror, and trauma. The officers didn't know about a number of the organizations that were in that room that day. But when we asked the attendees in the room how many people voted for local positions that directly affect the local grand jury process, very few, including us, knew that a number of those were elected positions. Now, we didn't walk out with everyone agreeing, but we walked out with a responsibility to continue listening and gaining new perspective to make the just societies that we dream of. That moment showed us the promise that amazing things can happen when people in government work together. Communities are flooded with talent and assets that make our city stronger for generations. We need to invest in that. Sometimes that means government becoming a policy partner, like they were for a group called Green Streets out in Hayes Valley, that leveraged a citywide sustainability policy to create jobs for young adults, sorting recycling from trash across local buildings in their own neighborhoods. And sometimes government's greatest partnership is to recognize that what they're doing isn't working. And they can partner with groups like Rising Foundations in New Orleans to break cycles of generational incarceration, which actually ends up not only solving a systemic social challenge, but saving money in the long run. After recessions, wars, corruption, insults, people have lost trust with institutions. But that does not mean all hope is lost. People can lose trust with institutions, but they can only build it with people. We see that every day, where we would rather have a stranger take us from point A to point B than a cab company. But if we can do that, we can also empathize with all of the cab drivers, like my uncle in Chicago, who paid their life savings for a medallion now worth nothing. How do we innovate and move forward without causing the same imbalance that caused the problem in the first place? How do we use the same tools that we're using to create smart cities to create equitable ones. In closing, the infighting between government leaders and the polarization of people is what really hurts us the most. But this is what elections do best. They super polarize our feelings and thoughts. You'll like this one. You're either on Team Tom Brady or Team Peyton Manning. I know where people are at here. And if you're not on one of those teams, you stand nowhere. And when elections are over, we're left with the impact of that division. The insults we throw or the jabs we take for political points tarnish our ability to progress after the spotlight is over. We should be proud, though. Good things are happening. The world is filled with amazing stories of communities coming together to build social wealth. In Atlanta, there's a group called Gangsters to Growers that teaches recently incarcerated youth how to grow food to be sold in restaurants across our city that currently don't even allow them to walk inside. There's a group called Soul Food Cypher that uses the power of hip hop and ciphers as a form of guidance counseling inside of schools. Communities are doing it already, and how do we empower that? And diversity is a good thing. We can be uncomfortable. It's a good thing. 
The Constitution was written by a bunch of elected men from around the country, unelected men. One would assume they were just a bunch of old guys talking around politics, and, but aside from good old Ben Franklin, the Constitution was the result of continued debates by young, passionate men, diverse in philosophical thought. They were the millennials of the 18th century. After the convention, the document was debated back and forth through the Federalist Papers, which was that generation's Twitter. And what was beautiful is that that document was amended 27 times by women who fought and earned the right to vote, by African Americans who, who regained the remaining two fifths of their compromised dignity, and by other unheard voices who decisions were made for, not with. So what would our constitutional convention look like today? Who would be in the room that we're not listening to? As the saying goes, solutions built for us, without us, are not for us. And we can't stop at an election. An election is a moment, but change requires a movement. And we can't get so caught up in trying to create a moment that we forget what it takes to make a movement. Communities and governments must build trust outside of these windows. But the greatest lessons still come back to my two heroes. Jimmy Carter on the brinks of war, discrimination, and corruption taught us that we can be honest and good as leaders. That we don't, we don't have to be perfect, but we have to be authentic and real and honest. That's how we trust. My grandfather reminds us that the community, community is truly where change begins. Communities are resilient because they're built person to person, not person to institution. Now I know the world is gonna be very sad the day that Jimmy Carter passes away. But I know wherever he goes next, he'll find a friend in my grandfather. Because when two people are honest, even a government leader and a community activist can be the best of friends. Thank you for your time.